All right, we'll wait another minute or so to see if we get any more people logging on. Yeah, welcome everybody. All right, I'll give it one more minute. Thank you everyone for your patience. I know it can be a pain to log into Zoom sometimes. All right, I'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure some of you are on your lunch break, so I don't wanna take up too much time. Um, but welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. I'll go ahead and share my screen to get this presentation started. Okay. All right. Thank you everybody so much for joining us. Um, I am Rebecca Hagen. I am the registrar at Falling Water where I oversee the care and documentation of the museum collection. Um, and before we get to Eleanor, I wanted to give a very brief overview of our textile collection. Um, and I did wanna mention that um, our director of preservation and collections, Scott Perkins is over there uh, and he is keeping track of any questions that pop up. So, please do feel free to um, be typing away in our comments in our Q&A section while we talk and we will get to as many as we can at the end. Um, but here's an image of the Kaufman family. Uh, Pittsburgh department store magnate Edgar Kaufman Sr. Um, commissioned Frank Lloyd Wright to build this weekend home for him in Bear Run, Pennsylvania in 1935. Um, so this is an image of Kaufman Sr. on the left his son, Edgar Kaufman Jr. in the middle and his wife, Lillian, on the right. Um, construction began in 1936 and was completed in 1937. And the, uh, the family quickly began um, moving in in December of that year. And this photo we have from our archival collection, we believe is from 1938. It must be pretty early on because um, it's pretty sparsely furnished. You can see that the light screen and the ceiling is not yet there. A lot of the Frank Lloyd Wright designed um, furniture hasn't been installed yet, the tables and the low seating. Um, but we do see a lot of basic furniture. And for the most part, it seems to be oriented around the fireplace, the hearth of the living room, um, which is sort of out of sight in that bottom right corner there. Um, but one of the first objects to be brought into the house is this beautiful Berber rug. And this one in particular, um, was made by the Beni Arain tribe in the Middle Atlas region of Morocco. But very quickly, the Kaufmans started decorating their home. Um, they really enjoyed a mix of high style pieces and more rustic pieces for their home. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright did design area rugs or did um, plan to design area rugs for falling water for this sort of large um, main living space, but the Kaufmans decided against that recommendation and instead use these more informal Berber rugs. Um, and moving into these more recent photographs, you can really see how the colors of the textures um, of these textiles really bring the home to life and they really pop on Wright's more neutral backdrops. So you see um, the stone, wood, steel, glass, concrete, all those um, sort of a neutral palette for these textiles to really um, 
pop out of. And this photo is taken slightly back from that last one. And here you can see um, how diverse the collection of textiles is. So we have, you know, at least 12 different textiles represented here. Um, we have, of course, the upholstered furniture, but also uh, throw blankets and cushions and furs and rugs. Um, so they really use these textiles to bring warmth to this house. And um, in total, we have about 350 textiles in our collection. Of course, we can't display all of those um, at once. So we do have a lot in collection storage, which is where I am uh, speaking to you from today. Uh, but we do also cycle the textiles um, in and out seasonally to give them breaks from um, all of this bright sunlight coming in through the windows. And um, we believe that the Kaufman's textiles were coming to the family in a few different ways. Um, the Kaufman department store did have about 20 buying offices worldwide. And then the family also traveled a lot to Europe and Mexico just on personal trips. So we think it's a mix. And of course, they're not only acquiring um, textiles, but also the rest of the objects you see in the house. And here's a little sort of sampling of the different textiles that might be in run one room. We have the Scottish tartan plaid on the bedspread. We have another, another Benny Arrain Berber rug on the floor. And then we have an Indonesian ikat on that chair. Um, and it looks like it's one from the Sabu Islands based on um, what I can see of the designs in this photo. Um, but along with these textiles that they're bringing in, there also is, of course, um, the upholstered Frank Lloyd Wright furniture. And Edgar Kaufman chose this Jack Lenore Larson uh, plain weave solid wool textile for um, those Frank Lloyd Wright pieces. And this colorway was um, added to the house in the 60s. So there's this mix of an ivory and a yellow and sort of an orangey red. Um, and of course, this was a living, breathing, used house for a few decades. So they were reupholstering as their um, as trends change and as their their tastes changed. And I did want to share this slide um, so you can really see some of the details of these incredible textiles in our collection. Um, of course, this can be considered um, a folk art. These are textiles woven, of course, mostly by women, um, but handmade um, and for the most part anonymous. But when you get into the details, you really see how modern they are and that really matches the Kaufman's aesthetic. Um, and this also gives a good idea of the diversity of the geographical regions our textiles are coming from. So just in this image, we have um, not only those Berber rugs I already mentioned, which we do have two different tribes represented. We also have Indonesian ikats and batiks. We have Indian paisley shawls, um, African kuba kente and mud cloths. We have Scottish tartans again, um, Middle Eastern kilim rugs, Greek flocati rugs. So we're really representing textiles from around the world, Mexican ponchos, that sort of thing. And again, American designers as well. So we have that Jack Lenore Larson uh, Landis print on the far right column, second from the top, um, which Edgar Jr. selected for the bedspread in his um, sleeping area of the house. And this is Edgar Kaufman Jr., a little bit older than that first image. Um, he donated the house and the surrounding land to the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy in 1963. And as part of that, he really stressed the importance of retaining um, the integrity of the home and highlighting its, um, of course, the architecture, but its relationship with nature. And to that end, um, sort of making the house the focus and wanting this not to feel like a static um, museum, uh, sort of more traditional historic house museum tour. And he, he wanted it to feel like you were a guest of the Kaufmans when you were here. So very informal, uh, very welcoming environment. So we don't have stanchions. You don't walk on commercial rugs when you come to visit. It very much feels like a home. And something he wanted us to do was to continue to uh, renew and refresh the house with new textiles as the um, earlier ones were worn out. So the original Kaufman textiles that we don't have on display are here in storage, um, but we do acquire new textiles as needed for the house. But um, sort of related to that, we've been working with 
our British weave designer, um, Eleanor Pritchard, to create new textiles for falling water. Um, Eleanor attended the Chelsea College of Art and Design, as well as the University of Birmingham. Uh, she also taught for eight years at the Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design. Her textiles, um, specifically blankets and cushions, are available in stores across the globe, as well as on her website. And Eleanor spent a week with us in December of 2018 and co-curated our exhibition in 2019 entitled um, Eleanor Pritchard Framing a View. So I'm going to turn it over to Eleanor. And Eleanor, thank you so much for joining us. All right, Eleanor, you might have to unmute. Let's see. There we go. Am I unmuted now? Yeah, okay. So, um, well, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is me in the studio here in Deptford. Um, you can see the yarn on the, um, on the wall behind in the image there is the same yarn behind me here. Um, so uh, as Rebecca said, I, um, I trained originally, I actually did a history degree before I, um, uh, sort of retrained in textiles. So um, there have been sort of two, two streams which have really influenced uh, my career is this sort of combination of history and, and weave. Um, the studio is in Deptford, which is uh, in southeast London. It's, um, it's quite near to Greenwich, which you may know from the observatory or the Naval College. Um, but Deptford itself has a really interesting history because it was um, a shipbuilding area and it, there were royal dockyards here from, um, from the 16th century onwards right through to the 19th century. So um, it's nice to be based in such a kind of historic area where things were being made. Um, through the centuries. Um, so we are best known, oops, we're best known for our blankets and this is, um, this is a double cloth blanket. So it's a reversible uh, wool blanket. The front and the back are almost, uh, the front is like the positive of the back and they are, um, they're really drawing on a tradition which you find all over the world. Double cloths are something which you find all over the world, but this um, tradition is very well known in Wales. Um, the traditional ones here are called Carthen. And um, so I feel as though um, I'm very much drawing on that tradition. Obviously the designs and the way that they're interpreted are entirely mine and contemporary, but the, um, the sense of uh, the, the, the sort of technique is, is a traditional Welsh one. And one of the reasons I really like working with blankets is uh, the scale. They're a really, they're a big size. You know, these are five by six foot at a minimum, often much larger. Um, so they're a nice sort of scale to work with. I love the functionality. I love the universality, the idea that, you know, all around the world, people for, for many, many centuries, people have used blankets. And they're a very kind of simple product. They're a, they're a great product to make because uh, they, they, you know, they don't involve a lot of um, pattern cutting or anything like that. So, uh, as I say, this is, uh, here you see one of our northerly blankets. Uh, this is in a shoot of Matthew Hilton furniture, which, uh, which is manufactured by a Portuguese company called Della Espada. So you can see it sort of in context there. And then the other line that we produce as a sort of standard line within the studio is um, upholstery. So these are um, woven contract upholstery fabrics. And on the image here, you can see it on a, uh, this is a design by Marcel Breuer, um, who of course was from the Bauhaus. Breuer spent a little time in London um, when he was sort of fleeing from, from Nazi Germany and, um, and stayed briefly in the Isacon building, which is um, in Lawn Road. And, um, and he was commissioned by um, Jack Pritchard, who runs the Isacon Furniture Company, which is a very well-known British ply furniture company, um, to design this, this series of, um, it's, it's a sofa and a, and a chair in, in the set. And um, only one set was ever made in 1936. So um, it was, it was, re, it was reissued in 2016 and uh, the same company, Isocon Plus, uh, selected our fabrics to use on the, for the reissue. So I was very um, pleased to have such a kind of 
such an interesting backstory. Um, these are more of the upholstery fabrics on, um, these are mid-century designs by a Japanese architect called Daisaku Cho. And uh, we work quite a lot in Japan, so um, always nice to, to sort of see the fabrics on, on different, different, um, different pieces of furniture. So that's, as I said, that's the two sides of the business, really. Um, we often work with um, partners. So the blanket that you see here was designed for, uh, it was for the Tate Gallery, and it was made to sell alongside the Big Annie Alba's retrospective show, which was in 2018. And um, of course, there's a nice connection between Annie Albers and Kaufman Jr. because uh, they, they were good friends and he was a great champion of her work. Um, so there's a, nice, there's a nice falling water connection there. But also I put it in because um, I wanted to kind of indicate how we very often, I, I start with little details of kind of found repeat pattern within architecture. So the on the um, left hand side there you'll see it's a it's a view looking up at the facade of Tate Modern which of course is a was a power station before it was converted into an art gallery um, with this beautiful I mean considering it was such a sort of functional building it has this beautiful brick um, sort of motif running along uh, a sort of frieze there. So as I say um, some of the most interesting projects we do are ones where we have a partner to work with. Um, so this obviously leads me on to Falling Water. Um, so here I am in December 2018. Um, I was absolutely thrilled when uh, it was Scott Perkins got in touch with me to ask if I would um, like to like to come and spend some time in the house. And um, as I was saying earlier, it really pulled everything together in terms of my interest in history and architecture, obviously in textiles, a chance to visit a really iconic, really iconic house um, and, and really to have time to develop something. It's, it's, a, it's a great luxury to have time. I, you know, very, very often designing is sort of done on the hoof on, with, with deadlines looming and all. And to have a week booked in just to, just to kind of hang around in the house was just extraordinary. Um, this is the guest room here and you can see um, again the sort of range of fabrics that Rebecca mentioned earlier. The two cubes there are in, are in the Daria fabric, the, the Jack Lena Larson fabric. And um, I'm, I, was, I was very taken with that fabric. I thought there's a, there's a really, be although it's a plain, there's no pattern in it, the texture is absolutely beautiful. Um, and then I think those are probably South American pieces on the, um, they look to me like they're, they're South American, although Rebecca will know for sure. Um, so that was, uh, that was me in December 2018. And as I say, I had, a, I had an opportunity to spend time in the house and um, the house is closed to visitors in the week time in December. So I actually had run of the house with, you know, uninterrupted by tours. And that was just the most extraordinary thing. And the first day that I was there, I, I took all the same cliched photos that I've seen a million times. And, you know, I, I, I kind of, I feel as though I, I was over, it was sensory overload. And I really, um, you know, I, I, I was sort of overwhelmed by what I could possibly do with, uh, with all this information, all the visual information. And then, then I thought, no, hang on a minute, you've got a week. Let's just, let's just calm down and just sort of, sit in the house and over time um you know i i i feel as though i had i had time to reflect i had time to watch this is obviously shadows on the floor which is this extraordinary um it's a pottsville sandstone very local sandstone which on the floor in the house is highly polished and varnished to create the effect of um really the boulders below the house so the the you know, it's, it's the feeling of wet, wet river stones, this sort of uneven floor. And here you can just see kind of that very low December shadows running over the, over the stones. Um, and I have a little quote, uh, which was, which is by Lillian Kaufman, who obviously, you know, lived in the house for a long time. And she said, um, she said about the, the, uh, the sort of feeling in the house, something that, that really spoke to me. She said, when my eye had become accustomed to the lack of ornament and colour, these two factors became apparent everywhere. I found ample colour in the warm stones of my fireplace, in the stone floor and walls. 
Lack of ornament brought out the amazing strength and loveliness of the architectural line and detail. I began to glory in the sense of space and peace with which, with which my room filled me. And as I say, I feel that like I had a bit of that, uh, that glorying in the space and peace while I was, uh, while I was at Falling Water. Um, and another, another thing that was a real, I mean, a, a real privilege was to sort of see behind the scenes. So this is a detail from the kitchen at Falling Water, which was installed, it was absolutely up to the date ModCon kitchen. It was um, the kind of the height of sophistication at the time. And I love all the chrome detailing and all these sort of um, kind of very, very futuristic details, like the draining thing you see on the side, there's lots of integral storage. Um, and it, this was a kitchen that was bought, um, it was a kitchen from the Kaufman department store, from the kitchen department there. Um, so they were obviously buying the very best that uh, they had in the department store. But what I really love are the watering cans here. So that the, um, the house always has flowers in it. It's one of the things that makes it feel like a home. And these are the watering cans of probably one of the longest serving employees at, at Falling Water, uh, somebody called Albert. And he looks after the flowers and um, he uses the sink in the kitchen every day to, um, to, you know, to water the flowers, to replenish the, all the, um, all the, all the vegetation. And I just love the mix of these. They look like they come from a dollar store, you know, mixed into this really iconic, iconic space. So the feeling of um, a house that's in some ways still, still a living house was, uh, you know, I was able to, to really see that. Um, I took a lot of images of little details. This is um, on this is on the man, on the sort of hearth in the master bedroom, and here you can see the way that the um, stone was treated differently. Uh, on the far right hand side, you see it highly varnished on the floor, and on the uh, the stone beneath the brush is the unvarnished version, which is how which is what was used on the walls. And you can see, although it's the same stone, it, it, it has a very different feel because of this um, much more matte surface. And I just love the objects and the sense that they give you a connection with the Kaufman family. And, um, you know, that a lot of them are, as Rebecca was saying, they're anonymous, they are folk pieces, they are, you know, vernacular, but they're absolutely exquisite. And I, and I really think the Kaufmans were very courageous in, in the way that they mixed um, pieces by very famous, you know, famous designers and artists with, with just vernacular anonymous pieces. Um, so I love this brush. And I had a chance to kind of, this, this I imagine probably has never been taken before as a shot. This is underneath, well, maybe by an engineer thinking about it. This is underneath the external staircase. It's looking up from underneath the staircase. And what you're seeing, um, the little red hoops are, um, they're the bottom of the banisters. It's the way the bottom of the banisters fits into the, into the steps. Um, so you can see I really had a chance to sort of explore every angle and nook and nook and cranny and um, and you know as I say it was it was an opportunity that I I, I really relish it'll it'll remain a highlight of my career for for all all time. This is a detail in the spare room um, and I love the the way I I know that because it's the only room that has blinds in the house and you can just see the light coming through these slatted blinds on the left hand side um, and I just again I love the light coming through and the sense of the the roughness of the plaster work it wasn't you know it's not beautifully finessed it's kind of it's really it's really nicely um, sort of honest in terms of the the finish on the materials. Um, Again, here materials. This is this is a sort of vernacular, uh, quite rustic chair, um, and I, I, it's that combination of sort of timber with the with the basket and the and the stone below. Um, so these were the kind of images I started taking after a, after a day or two. Um, stopped worrying about sort of being overwhelmed by the whole house and got much more involved in the sort of details. Um, Another thing that was amazing about having time in the house was um, was the chance to really explore the archive and to be able to um, to tap into the extraordinary expertise of Rebecca and Scott. Um, and so we were able to to you know pull out letters, correspondence. Um, 
different documents, lots of the textiles. But another, um, I, I just on a purely aesthetic level, I, I really I have a real liking for sort of these archivals. Again, you can see in terms of pattern, it's a repeated sort of geometric unit pattern. And I just loved the, the kind of the way that you have this sort of almost like corsetry lacing or, or brogue shoes, the sort of punching along the edge there. So um, the archive was a real treat. The, the visually as well as all the the content that was there and one of the things that I found most really gave me sort of tingles down my spine was this which is a um, this is the the sort of survey that was done before the house was built you can see it's got a date of um, well, it says 35 there 35 to 36 but it was it was basically the survey prior to the um, prior to the building of the house. So at this stage, the house isn't, you know, we don't even know what the house will look like. No, no one, no one had, you know, um, it's, it's sort of, it's sort of a blank slate. And so I love, I love the book for the sense of the possibilities of what might come. Of course, in hindsight, we all know now what was built there. But at this stage, it was just, it was, it was, you know, as I say, a blank slate. And I also really love the, the idea of code. You can see um, these little maps. There are a lot of diagrams in the book. There are these little kind of keys that the surveyor has made. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit later on about code in relation to, to weave plans. So I like the idea of, of sort of languages that, um, you know, we might not, I might not understand, but obviously make a lot of sense to the person who's, who's um, making the notes. Um, and then the, the last thing that I really love about this is just the aesthetics. Again, it feels to me, this feels to me very much like a woven table linen. I love the, the, the blue lines running horizontally intersected by these orange lines. The fact that on the left hand side, it's a much more open grid. On the, left, on the right hand side, you see it's a much tighter grid. And um, there are blank pages in the book towards the end where it was obviously not um, filled up completely. And um, those in themselves are very beautiful. So um, you can see I'm a bit of a stationary junkie. Um, so while I was while I was in the house, I started I as well as taking lots of photographs, I, I did quite a lot of writing of notes and I did um, quite a lot of quick sketches and paper cuts. And this the sharp eyed of you who, who know the house well will recognize this is my quick drawing of um, a Lionel Feininger uh, painting, which is um, in the house. And he was a a Bauhaus, a Bauhaus master, um, and again went to the States um, in, I think, in the 30s. But this was, I really love this painting. So this is just my little drawing of a detail from the, from the painting. Um, but I did a lot of these paper cuts. These are sort of paper collage. This is another view in the kitchen. It's a different cupboard that's open here. And here you see, I think they're flower stores. Um, but you can see what I mean about how the kitchen was sort of fully integrated with all these kind of mod cons in it. And, um, and I often work with paper collage starting to sort of, it's, it's still representational, but it's sort of simplified, starts to get flattened and a little bit abstracted. So um, these were the sort of things I was doing while I was, um, while I was staying at the house. Um, this is uh, this is a view again. This is a paper cut of a view down through the hatch in the living room. It's the stairs that run down to the river below. Um, and again, there was very very low sun coming through. So so what you see in the dark grey is actually all the shadow, um, and these beautiful red banisters running down. Uh, so this was another quick piece I made while whilst I was at the house. Um, and now. I'm going to move on to the the show. So, as Rebecca said, we we um, as Scott and I discussed the idea of creating an exhibition um, about a combination of things. So it was partly about my time at the house. It was partly about my own creative process. It was about the textiles within the house and the collections, and um, and it was specifically telling the story of the piece that I made for the house. So. Um, one of the things we wanted to do was recreate the, um, the pin board that I have in the studio. So I, I have a pin board in the studio, not as big as this one. This was 12 by six foot. So a real kind of 
lovely giant scale. And you can probably see some of the elements I've already talked about. Here's the, um, the steps here. You can see the kitchen bits on the side there. Um, this pattern you'll see later on when I, when I talk about, um, about uh, sort of woven responses. These are these are little drawings I've done. So it was really, it was really, it's sort of what I'd call flotsam and jetsam. It's things that, that um, they may seem random to other people, but they have some connection for me and uh, they're part of the sort of creative process. So this is me with my, uh, my long suffering husband helping, helping to install the show. Um, so, so this was one of the elements in, in the exhibition at the Speyer Gallery, which ran through uh, from July through to December. And this was another element that we had in the gallery and this, um, this was a combination, these are textiles from the archive and from the, from the collection. You can see the kind of range that, um, that Rebecca was speaking about earlier. Um, I picked out pieces that just aesthetically sort of appealed to me particularly. Um, and they're combined with those archive boxes that I love so much, uh, which give a nice sort of sense of space within the installation. And then obviously the yarn cones is again referencing my own studio, very much like the yarn behind me here. So this was another element in the exhibition. Um, and we included some of the key fabrics. So Rebecca's already touched on this piece. This is the um, this is the Landis fabric. This was designed by Richard Landis for the Jack Lena Larson studio. And uh, it was originally, it was um, uh, used as a sort of bed cover on the uh, third floor bed. It was Kaufman, Kaufman Jr.'s, um, Edgar Jr.'s bed. And this it's very, I feel when I see this, I feel a kindred spirit because the, the technique here is very much the same technique that I use. It's a double cloth. Here it's a stitched double cloth. You can see the little dots are where um, the two layers of the fabric are kind of joined together. You can see that the, the you see that positive negative thing that I was talking about earlier. So in this case, one whole layer is in the sort of neutral color and one layer is this kind of crazy bright check. And the points at which the, the color changes, you've got the, the layers interlocking and they, so the, the front appears on the back and vice versa. And that technique, as I say, of double cloth is something that I use all the time. Uh, so I was really happy to find this. And as I say, this, this feels incredibly familiar to me um, in terms of sort of technique and the, the sort of thinking of, of how these structures work. So we included this in the show. Um, we also included 270 bobbins, which I wound, and uh, they were installed in one of the windows, in the windows in the, in, coming into the gallery. Um, so there were some kind of fun elements as well. Um, but the real, the lasting piece, which, um, you know, the, the exhibition has, has come down now. Obviously, there's, there, there's, I'm sure, plans afoot for what might be there in the future. But um, the, the, the piece, which sort of is the lasting legacy, really, is this blanket. And this is called Fenestra. And you can see it here on the, it's folded here on the end of the bed. Um, this, is, this is Edgar Jr.'s bed and it's where the Landis would have been. So it feels very much at home there. Um, happily, the, the colours coordinate very nicely with the, um, whatever the magazine is on the reading rack there. So uh, that's been nicely, nicely styled by somebody, maybe unintentionally, but um, so, what I'd really like to do is talk about this, this blanket in particular. Um, as part of the exhibition, we told the sort of narrative of the blanket, um, starting from really concept, visual research, drawings, through, through the sort of technical process of how you turn an idea into a woven, into a design, and then how you turn a design into a woven fabric. Um, so we have this long kind of linear showcase in the exhibition and that's the story that I'd like to, uh, to share with you now. Um, so the blanket is called Fenestra and that's the Welsh term for window. And there are several Welsh connections um, which, which made, the, um, made the name feel appropriate. Of course, Frank Lloyd Wright has Welsh heritage. 
um, the blanket was also woven in Wales. And as I say, I myself draw a lot on the tradition of, of Karten, these, these Welsh double cloth blankets. So, um, so you can see it was named for the windows and it's very much drawing inspiration from the windows. Um, on the small image there, you see the, the extraordinary tall casement window um, with these small square panes and then the long, the long um, vertical um, sort of metal struts. And then on the on the right hand side is a little detail from a drawing I did. Uh, this one is, I think, in the guest house. And you can see my very simple abstraction of, of the Berber rugs that Rebecca was talking about um, on the floor there. So um, this was another little drawing I did at the uh, while I was while I was staying at the house. Um, and this this is, a, again, a paper cut um, starting to get quite abstracted, but very much you still, you still read the pattern of the windows there. Um, and one of the things I found most extraordinary is the way that the windows, where they meet the stone on the, um, there is no vertical frame. So these horizontal metal frames just run straight into the stone. And it, it feels so contemporary. When you think that the house was built in 1936, it's just extraordinary that, um, you know, it just, it, it feels so sort of clean and as I say, so contemporary. So I loved that, that detail. Um, so this was, as I say, a little paper cut I did. Um, starting to think about the palette, the windows are all painted, all, in fact, all the metalwork, including the fire grates and all the, all the kind of fixed metalwork in the house are painted with a color that's called Cherokee red. And that is a color which was, used by it was it's actually from the Oldsmobile um, car company and it was one of the standard colors they offered for their car finishes and um, Frank Lloyd Wright obviously it caught his eye and he's used it I think in a number of the houses that he built but you can see it you can see the original it's 1935 there the um, the paint the original paint card and at the bottom there is the Cherokee red um, so Obviously, that that's a really key color um, in terms of um, you know any design which involves reference to the windows. Um, so here I started to put the palette together, and you can see that I've actually used the on the on the left hand side. You'll see what are called windings, and they're a very quick way to start to sort of explore how yarn will mix. So. Um, on, with the big red one, you'll see there's, there's a brighter red on one side and a darker red on the other. And in the center, it's alternating threads of the two reds. And as I say, these are, these are absolutely not technical. They're just a very quick sort of exercise in, in color blending, really. So they're just wound on little bits of cardboard. But you can start to imagine how warp and weft will mix how the how you can get these these kind of mid tones in between two different tones so there's obviously the reds there's the um the black there is very much drawing it's a sort of charcoal color it's drawing on the the sort of the charred wood in the fireplace in the grate that i uh, had in the last image um that sort of soot soot black color and then um the the neutral colors are um, are really referencing the the sandstone that pots that beautiful Pottswell sandstone um, in particular the where it's used on the wall in the unvarnished um, unvarnished state um, so once the colors sorted out then um, this is me working out the pattern and I work in a very on it's very old school it's not at all uh, don't use a computer for design I this is this is collage here simple simple paper collage but by this stage I'm working out the scale the proportion how the repeat will work and also thinking technically about within all the parameters of weaving what would be possible so um, this is this is the sort of this is starting to refine the design process into something that that could be translated into a woven fabric so um, and this is actually very close to the pattern that ended up on the blanket um, here you see the warps. So this is the warping frame in the studio here. And I'm sure you all know that, that weaving consists of warps and wefts. And the warp is the yarn that's on the loom. And the weft is the yarn that gets woven in as you weave. And um, it, it runs 
in and out of the warp. So here um, you can see the warp and you can see that um, I, the patterns already, the warp has already been, the, the colors have been um, sort of chosen for the warp. So you've got this combination of the two reds with the black. Um, and on the other image on the uh, left hand side, you'll see the, the warp that's been made on the right, but also the second more neutral warp, a little bit like the Landis fabric. There's these two separate warps. One was neutral and one has the color in it. Um, now these images, I'm afraid uh, these are from a different, uh, from a different fabric, but I, they, they indicate quite well how, um, how um, the process works from making a warp through to making fabric. So I just, I'll just run through them very quickly. So, the warping frame is on the far left, and this is my uh, studio manager Holly there putting in the um, these are these are these are called the um, what are they called? It, she's putting in the cross, and it determined what she's doing is counting thread consecutive threads into groups, which will determine how many threads there are in an inch. So um, if you, you, you may have seen on kind of really fine Egyptian cotton sheets or something, people talk about thread count. And that's what we're doing here is working out how many threads should go in an inch. And um, in the center image, those little bundles of threads are being distributed on what's called, this is called a rattle here. And this is basically like a big comb with, um, with a series of, of sort of uh, gaps that the threads are put into so that you can, as I say, you can, you can, you can um, make sure that you've got the right number of threads and the threads are remaining in the right order. And then on the, uh, on the right, you see the um, warp being wound onto the loom here. And um, so, so we have two beams, there's a beam at the top and a beam at the bottom that you, you can't really see it, but it's just here. And um, it's wound on always, we always use a layer of newspaper between the, between the layers of the warp as they're wound on. So that it, basically they, they don't all sync together. It keeps the, keeps the warp all in order. And um, those are all copies of the Financial Times, which I found are the best, uh, best for this job because it's a big broadsheet and it's, um, it's got very high quality print. So the ink doesn't smudge at all. So, um, Old copies of the FT are always sought after in the studio. Um, and here are some of the tools that you'll see in the next image. So at the bottom here we have a threading hook and this is a, a reed hook. This is a this is a kind of combination with threading at one end and the reading at the other end and then there's obviously a, a shuttle there as well. Um, and here you see the threading. So this is again Holly threading up each each thread goes through what's called a heddle and that's one of these wire um these sort of wires here which has a little eye in it it's a bit like a, the eye in a needle and um the pattern is made by a combination of the each each heddle is on a different shaft and it's a combination of how how you thread it up and then how you lift the shafts so um the first job is threading up perhaps um sometimes just a couple of hundred, sometimes it might be a thousand threads. So you want to make sure you've, you've done that correctly. And then on the, um, on the side here, you can see the other hook here. This is the, um, the reed hook. And this is after it's being threaded, we're now at the front of the loom and the threads are being brought through uh, what's called the reed or sometimes it's called the beta. And that again, makes sure that the threads are the right density, that they are not, they're all in the right order. And it's also the mechanism by which we will be able to beat down the, um, the weft threads uh, when, when the weaving is actually taking place. So once it's readed, it gets tied on at the front. And then these are weights here, which provide the tension. So the whole loom works with, with this system of tensioning, um, and it's always extraordinary to, to me that you can have a, you know, you t a single thread might break quite easily. As soon as you've got a number of them, the weight you can, uh, you, you need on the back is, is phenomenal. So these are, these are really heavy weights here, tensioning the, the, the warp. Um, so here's this, here's the warp running through there. And you can see there are two different warps, which will together make one single fabric. Um, so this is very much how these double cloths work. Um, Next, once the threading's done, you have to decide what your 
lifting planets. So we've moved from the warp threads here to the weft threads. And just referencing back to what I was saying earlier about codes, this is a weave plan. And it probably looks like kind of the, sort of a nice pattern, but may, maybe doesn't mean anything unless you unless you weave. But if you if you know how to read it, it gives you all the instructions for um, really how to program the loom. So this is a very simple binary code. And um, if you think about weaving, the simplest weaving is just odds and evens. So you would lift up the odds, put a thread across, and then lift up the evens and put a thread across. And this is basically what's happening here. We've got a binary code, which I've, um, I've designed the, the, I've sort of planned the, the pattern that I want. And then I'm programming it into the wooden strips on the left hand side and each of those wooden strips represents one thread in the weft so where there's where where there's a hole if there's no peg in it the the threads on that corresponding shaft stay down if you put a peg in it the peg engages with a hook and that lifts those shafts and those threads are up for that line so each of these each of these strips of wood are basically one thread in the weft pattern. So we move consecutively along this kind of caterpillar track. And what you're seeing here is, is basically a translation of what you're seeing in the lines along here. So, so these little X's in here mean that there's, they correspond with a peg in a hole here. So it's, it's a computer, but it's a very simple analog computer. It's, um, it's the kind of computer I can get my head around. Um, I, I really love, I really love the, the sort of way that you see exactly what's happening. Um, there are a lot of parameters that you're working with, um, with this kind of weaving. And I find them very helpful in the design process. I actually really like working within the limitations that um, these particular looms and this, this sort of process. Um, and of course, within, within any, um, within any set of parameters. Beyond that, the, the possibilities are absolutely limitless. So, um, so here you see the top of the loom. And now this is the programmed, this is the program. These are the, the strips of wood. And you can see that they, they, it's a bit like a caterpillar track on a, on a uh, tank. They, as, as you weave, they move around, they kind of click around to the next one. And, um, and each time they move on one, you put another thread in, and that's what creates the pattern. Um, so they, there, there are some hooks at the top here. These are engaging with these, these pegs, and they're lifting these shafts. And as I say, once you've worked out what your pattern is, um, you, it, it, you, you program it in and, and, um, and you get this, this is what will happen. So all the heddles that are on the shafts where there was a, a peg in the hole lift up and all the ones that had no peg stay down and that's where your weft thread runs through. And um, this is what's called a shed. So you, you need all those weights on the back of the loom to create a good shed. You need a lot of tension to make sure that that gap is nice and big. Um, so here you can see the shuttle coming through with the beta um, here in, in place. So that's, uh, that's the process. And here you can see it's sort of all at work. So this is me here. You can see the warping frame behind. Um, the pattern's moved on by treadling. So each time I, I, I press down on the pedal here, it moves on to the next pattern. Here's the Here's the code up here. This is the, the program. And here, these are the hooks that lift up. You can just see a gap here where, where the next thread is going through. So that's the, um, so that's the sort of process of, of weaving. And that, that was, um, I'm sure for people who are familiar with it, it will make sense. It's probably quite complicated to get your head around without watching a video or something. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's a really, well, it really appeals to me as a technique. As I say, I like the parameters. I'm surprised I ended up doing something that involves so much maths and planning. I don't think of myself as a particularly sort of organized person, but um, it, I, I feel as soon as I, I tried it at college, I knew I'd found my metier. Um, so this is back to the fenestra um, on the loom, on the sampling loom here. Um, so trying, trying out 
uh, playing playing with some of the sort of details of the pattern. Um, although, as I say, a lot of the design and planning has already been done before you start any of the weaving. Um, and then once the design is set and I know exactly what what I'm doing, I write up the notes and we um, instruct the mills that we work with to basically reproduce exactly what I've woven by hand. So this is the mill in Wales where the Fenestra blanket was woven. It's a small traditional blanket mill. It's, um, it's, it's owned and run by um, Raymond and Diane Jones who have been there since 1954. So um, it's really weaving in their blood there. Um, and as I say, they, we, we specify the yarn, exactly the same yarn that, that we've used in the studio, and we give them all the details, and they are basically on a bigger scale, recreating exactly what, what I've woven in the studio. So this is in the mill. You can see they're making warps with several threads at once, and they have a um, more complicated way to, this is um, how the threads are, are transferred onto the loom. But essentially it's doing exactly the same thing that studio, that's happening in the studio. Once the loom is weaving, they are power looms. So they're putting in about 300 threads in a minute, which is a hell of a lot faster than me. But it's, um, as I say, it's, it's essentially doing the same process. And after the fabrics are woven, they go up to Scotland and this is the finishers. So they go to a finishers in Scotland, which is where they're washed and pressed and um and they're, they're kind of they then they come back to to the studio as sort of roll bolts of fabric um and then the very last stage is making up so uh here you see our uh, 1950s singer 138 machine which is still the very best blanket stitch machine in my opinion um so this is doing the whipped edges on the blankets um so this is the sort of uh, right at the end of the process um, and there you see the blanket. You see this idea of the, these, the small windows in the casement pattern, these long horizontal elements that sort of stop short of the end. They, sort of this idea that they, that, do you remember what I was saying about running into the, into the stone? You see the way the front and the back are sort of the opposite of each other and all those yarn mixes. So here we have the two reds mixing. Here we have this charcoal colour mixing with the reds. So um, the, the back is just as important as the front. Um, you need to make sure that, that that works well as well. So this is the Fenestra, the finished blanket. Um, and here you see it as a pillow. This is on the, uh, in Kaufman, Edgar, Edgar Jr's uh, study. And you can see what I mean about the windows, about the frames just running into the stone here. Sort of picked up here, very that sort of sooty colour here, the 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 kind of stone colours in the in the in the stone behind, and of course those amazing reds. Um, and then there's a tiny postscript. I know we're almost out of time, but um, the happy news is that the uh, connection with falling water continues, and we have just made a new blanket for falling water. So this is called the carig. Um, carig is the Welsh word for stone, and this is. You may remember in the picture of the um, the big corkboard we were installing in the exhibition, there was a paper um, sort of collage of a pattern, and that this is the Carrig pattern. Um, so here it is in the studio on the loom, and this is my pinboard in in my studio here. So you can you can see how how we were really recreating that effectively. And here's the Carrig pattern here, and and here are some more. This is the sort of paper cut that that influenced that pattern. Um, so the pattern really is an abstraction from the this fireplace which is in the guest house again. Again here you see this lovely Berber rug and I um, I sometimes sometimes have a sort of um, dream where I'm an architect so I think I, I, I I rather indulge myself with these sort of little funny drawings, which are totally inaccurate, no measurements, but just the sense of sort of elevations. So um, this is my funny little sort of, um, it's like a little cat, it's not even cat, it's just a little uh, diagram of what's happening here. As I say, not accurate at all, but um, you've got this great big monolithic kind of like a cliff edge above the hearth. And it's interesting because it's a hearth right in a corner. So here's the hearth. And then you have these nice long hearthstones that run along the bottom. And it's really 
an abstraction of those three elements that made the, the Carrick pattern. So again, this is a paper cut, which I did. Here's that big, that big monolithic bit and the hearth and the, here, here you can see the window frames on the side and again, the Berber rug at the bottom. Um, in this case, the colors were more of a mix. Um, so the gold is taken directly from these beautiful Daria fabrics. Um, I, I love this color. And I, um, so, so the gold in the Carrig blanket is very much drawing on this. Um, I, I love the playfulness of these pieces and the way that they're almost like sort of building blocks. You can, you can, they're like children's toys. You can kind of rearrange the cushions to make these sort of different little, compositions um, and then on the floor these zabutons which again are such playful pieces of furniture so um, the gold very much comes from that and then we're picking up on the uh, the sort of bluer tones in some of these varnished stones and um, and again this this sort of silvery greys in the in the stone here um, so this is the warp this is the carrig warp on the on the loom in the studio um, again you can see how it's two different warps that lock together to form um, to form a single fabric at the other end once it's woven. Um, and you can maybe just see what I mean about this double lead, that I'm holding apart the two layers of the fabric here. So although they are, they appear flat, actually it's a series of pockets. That's how the patterns are created with a series of these sort of interlocking pockets. So this is the, this is the Carrig sample. This is the sort of handwoven sample of the loom there. Um, and this is it in um, on the power loom. This is actually being woven in uh, the other mill we work with in Lancashire, and they have these um, Dornier looms, which um, I particularly like the industrial green against the other the colours in the blanket here. So um, this was in March, just before the lockdown happened. It was one of the last uh, last projects they wove, and you can really read the pattern quite clearly here. Um, so as I say, this is the mill where this one was woven and this is um, third generation family mill. Um, it's the original mill building state back to Thomas Arkwright. So it's got a kind of real, a, a sort of textile history there. Um, and as I say, it's uh, the fabric was woven here and then it's now at the finishers. So we're hoping it's going to be back with us soon. Uh, I put this, this image in because I, I, I'm really hoping that we're going to be packing boxes to uh, ship off to Falling Water shortly with, um, with, the, with the finished blankets in them. Um, and that's the end of the presentation. So thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, I, if you want to read anything more about um, any of the, the elements in, that I've been talking about, uh, on, on my website, there's a section which, which is called projects. And with it, if you scroll through that, you'll, you'll see the Falling Water logo is one of the, one of the projects that, that I've worked on. And there's a link within that Falling Water page to all the different, I wrote a lot of journal posts both during my time at Falling Water and in the sort of subsequent months. So um, there's a lot more detail about things like the Knowles Morris, that little, um, the little survey book. There's stuff about, um, about the Fenestra. Um, there's lo lots of, lots more information. So um, that, as I say, if you, if, you, if you want to read that, you can find it on my website. Um, and thank you very much for, for joining me. Yes, thank you, Eleanor. Um, I can say I'm familiar with your work, but that was absolutely fascinating. And it makes me want to go out and get a loom and tie <laughs> my hand at it. So thank you. Um, before we move on to questions, I did just want to say a thank you for everyone um, who attended. And as you can see here, donations are welcome if you are able and interested to. Uh, of course, as I'm sure you understand, it's been a challenging few months at Falling Water while we've been closed to tours. but the preservation work always continues, it never stops. Um, and of course, that's referring to not only the, the architecture, but the collection itself. Um, we have recently conserved our paintings and our sculptures, and now we're hoping to move on to our works on paper and our basket collection. Um, and of course, other objects in the house that need attention. Um, so thank you so much for your support. We certainly couldn't, um, you know, completely care for this collection on our own. So you're support is invaluable. So thank you so much. And that said, I will pass it on to Scott with any questions. 
Sure, yeah, thank you, Eleanor. Um, we do have quite a few questions and, and a lot of them um, kind of focus on um, the sort of technique of weaving, but I wanted to maybe start with some of them that had to do with the time you spent in the house. Hmm. And um, one person had asked if you found yourself um, sort of returning to the same room or the same corner of the house mm -hmm. and what that was and why that was, do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I did. I definitely developed kind of favorite. Fav I, I, I love the third floor. I think of the sort of feeling of, um, I guess, sort of a little bit away from the main, the main part of the house. Um, the views are great from up there. And in the winter, of course, a lot of the leaves are missing on the trees. So you, so you get those sort of longer views. Um, the spaces are, are, are maybe more intimate than, than the, uh, the lower floors. So this is the floor. So this was Edgar Jr.'s kind of realm, really. Um, that's where I would, I would definitely stay if I was a guest at Falling Water. Um, having said that, I, I really love the guest house as well I think um, that feeling of, of sort of separation from the house and um, it's a kind of it's just it feels incredibly comfortable um, so I think it's probably that the, the, the sort of slightly less grandstanding parts of the house actually probably appeal the most to me great yeah. um, lots of, of questions actually lots of compliments on the clarity of explaining the weaving process oh. which I also <laughs> thought was that, was that was gonna be my comment but I guess um, there, there have been questions about too what drew you to weaving yeah um, you know how did you start was it just uh, an interest in the history or the historical side of things or what I've always I've always liked making things so that that was um, you know kind of using my using my hands I think the thing with weaving, it's, it feels almost like magic that you're going from, there's an element of alchemy in it. You're going from a thread and you're creating a fabric. And it's like, I mean, I guess it applies to any kind of constructed textile, but the idea that you, you're not working on top of an existing piece of fabric, you're not printing on top or painting or embroidering, you're, you're creating something and the process is, the structure and the construction and the pattern are all one and the same thing. So um, that really appeals to me. It's like you're, you're thinking about lots of different things at the same time. Um, as I say, the, the, the parameters are very appealing to me as well. I think um, I find them very helpful. And working with um, mills in the way that we do, commissioning um, um, mills for, for the production, um, there are even more parameters. So, so um, you know, you need to talk to your mills first about what their looms can do before you do any designing, because otherwise you're you're sort of you design for something that's not uh, that their looms won't won't be able to recreate, and then everything's a sort of compromise after that. So, um, as I say, I like knowing the rules. Um, I do the the this sort of history of the universality really appeals to me. We were talking earlier just before the uh, the seminar started about. Uh, you know, textiles from all over the every corner, every, every almost every um, different group of humans has created textiles in one way or another, woven textiles, um, nomadic people, maybe weaving very narrow fabrics. Um, there's, um, you know, from the from the most simple sort of homespun fabrics, the most most um, involved, elegant, and and kind of complex ones. And I think that appeals to me as well, the age old sort of sense that um, when I was talking earlier about um, the, loom, the tensioning on the loom, the loom weights, of course, loom weights are something that turn up in archaeological digs all the time. And so, you know, you have this sense of the and, and although looms may have got a bit more sophisticated over the, the millennia, actually what they're doing is the same thing. They're just doing over and under. And that really appeals to me that, you know, you might have a fancy I mean a lot of modern looms are, are, are a computerized a, a kind of more computerized version than mine but essentially they're doing the same thing and I think that there's something very appealing about those that idea that you're part of an incredibly long line of, of practitioners. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to the student in your class that goes to the computer <laughs> before going to the sketchbook and the cut paper? Uh, <laughs> well Personally, I, I um, 
I'm very hands on. So um, I, but I, you know, I, I accept that that it may be a generational thing, and I um, and I think computers can be the most amazing design tools. I would say the important thing is to make sure that you're starting from something that's unique. Otherwise, you're going to create something that feels derivative. And I think that the way um, for me to make sure that I'm not just reproducing something that's been done before, it may be drawing on traditions, but it's something that, you know, is a unique piece on its own, is to go through that process of starting really with the drawing and the collage. Um, if you skip that stage, somehow the designs, they just don't feel as though they have the originality that, uh, that they should. So I would say, yeah, you have to do the sketchbook bit. I know okay. students, a lot of students hate it, but as I say, I think sketchbooks can be very loose. I think it can involve, you know, it can, as I say, it can involve collage, it can involve painting, it can involve, um, you know, finding old newspaper images and chopping them up and whatever. So um, find what works for you, I guess. Mm -hmm. But if you miss that stage of really observational work, you will, as I say, I think, I think it's very difficult to create something that doesn't feel derivative. Mm -hmm. So your um, exhibition that was here, like Rebecca mentioned, we had some textiles we pulled from mm. our archives to kind of accompany the, the show and, and talk about things that inspired you. And a number of them had um, other materials than wool. I mean, we had definitely some mm. cotton pieces, but we had a couple of pieces that had cellophane. We had sort of raffia. Any um, work with those kinds of materials in your you know sort of playfulness of creating weaves or has it always been wool and it's always been um... it, no now with the sort of uh with the production that we do and all it it is it is all wool um in my my kind of time at college i i played around with a lot of different fabrics and one of the first um one of the first commissions i got when i when i left college was uh weaving for the uh, couture studio at lacroix christian lacroix and um, you can imagine the range of kind of fabrics that they were using. So um, I was, I, I made a whole series of pieces where I was tearing up, um, it, they was, it was fine silk, like a sort of, um, a, it's a very fine silk fabric that you might use in lining a really high class jacket or something. And I was tearing those up to create ribbons that I was weaving with and um, I was using a lot of shiny uh, yarns like viscose and rayon and things. So I have, I have used other yarns in my, in my kind of, in my time, but I think the, the wool is so, um, for, in, in terms of sort of working with it, it's a, it's a, it's a material that I really love. It's, it's, it's very forgiving. It's got a lot of elasticity in it. It's uh, obviously, extremely sustainable it's a natural fiber um, and it just feels like the right thing to be using based here in the UK obviously um, we're, we're a pretty cold climate and um, we've got a long tradition of, of, um, of sheep here so um, so wool is wool is the, the fallback that I that I come back to all the time great well, I think we've we've exceeded our time limit here and um, answered most of the questions that came through. I want to thank you again, and I'll turn it back to Rebecca to sign everyone off. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. If you have any questions that we didn't have a chance to get to, feel free to visit our website. Um, we do have um, a general email that you can send questions to. Um, and we also have our collection online now, although uh, we don't have too many textiles up but please again, visit our website under the collections section and you can have access to our collections database. Um, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Eleanor, again, that was wonderful. It's always great to hear from you. And thank you, Scott, for um, leading the charge and being our moderator. So yes, the recording will be up on our website on the event page soon.